80 manuscripts. It's not good. Or be like, I fixed it last night and then. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get what you pay for. Yes. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, chapter five, we're talking about uh, hash functions. <coughs> so I think uh, previously we had covered the definition of a cryptographic hash function. So there's five properties that we want from a cryptographic hash function. Those are? Compression. Compression. Efficiency. Efficiency. One way. And then the two collision resistance properties. Now, if you're going to do a brute force kind of attack on a... You know, so what's the equivalent of a brute force attack on a hash function? What do you do? What's the attack? Find a collision. Okay, it's really that strong collision resistance that you're going after. Okay, so you want to find any two things that hash to the same value. If you can do that, the hash function is considered broken. Okay, you've attacked it sort of like an exhaustive key search. You know, it doesn't matter how strong the underlying algorithm is. It really just depends on what? How many hashes do you need to compute? In other words, how many hashes do you need to compute before you expect to find that collision? Why is it, I mean, once you find a single collision, why does that lead to more, why is the whole hash broken? Uh, um, you'll get at least some hint of that when you do the homework problems. Um, the problem is, um, it, it sort of looks, okay, I, I mean, I can sort of see the question. It sort of looks like when you, say, look at the problem of uh, digital signatures, that you'd have to have a specific message that hashes to something that matches some other message and all that. Um, but there's kind of ways around that. Okay, there's some tricks you can do, and I'll give you a specific example to look at to, to think about, okay? So it will show that even though these two things that sort of cause the collision look sort of just like random bits, they don't look like they mean anything, you can take advantage of that one collision and you can create problems, okay? So. Uh, okay, so anyway, the collision resistance, back to the collision resistance, okay? So how many hashes do I need to compute before I expect to find a collision? Three, four, five. Give me a number. Okay, birthday problem. Remember this thing called the birthday problem? Okay, how many people had to be in the same room before we expect to find two with the same birthday? 23. 23, where does 23 come from? It's roughly the square root of 365. Okay, so square root of how many things do I need to hash before I expect to find a collision? square root of num the number of possible outputs of the hash function. So if it's an n bit hash, there's 2 to the n different possible outputs. Square root of that is 2 to the n over 2. So if you can compute, if you can just generate 2 to the n over 2 things, random values, and hash them, you expect to find a collision and you've broken the hash function. Okay? So that's kind of the magic number. Again, you'll have some homework problems related to that, so hopefully it's clearer after we uh, do the homework problems. Uh, okay, so we looked at the uh, birthday problem, then we looked at the HMAC. Okay, so what's the purpose of an HMAC? What is an HMAC? It's a hash MAC. Okay, what's a MAC for? Uh, integrity, okay, so an HMAC is for integrity as well. It's just a hashed version of the MAC. So it's a way to protect the integrity. Okay, but when we want to protect integrity, we have to have a key. Okay, hash function doesn't have a key, so an HMAC is really just an algorithm that shows you how to combine a key with a hash. Okay, and that's the proper and approved way to compute the, uh, uh, to combine a key with a hash. Now, Later on, we may get some situations where we want to use a key with a hash, and we'll just hash the key with the message. So we may not always follow the HMAC thing, but you should, at least in uh, computing an HMAC. That's uh, the proper way to do it. Uh, okay, so uh, along with the, okay, our original motivation for looking at the hash was digital signatures. Okay, we don't sign the message itself. Instead, we sign the hash, oh, this is like pulling teeth. This is signing the hash of the message. Okay, so why do we do that? Why do we sign the hash instead of the message itself? Signing the 
It's computationally intensive, right? It's very expensive to do a public or private key operation. So we want a smaller thing to hash. So we compress it down to something small and hash that. And that's why we have all these demanding properties on the cryptographic hash, is because we're using it in this vital cryptographic application. And people can find collisions, they can break our signature scheme through the hash function. Uh, okay, so those are sort of the um, usual uses for hash functions. Now there are a bunch of other sort of clever, uh, you know, sometimes not all that intuitive uses for hash functions as well. So last time we talked about that online bidding thing, right, where, um, you know, Alice, Bob, and Charlie want to place their bids. They don't trust the, uh, whoever they're giving their bids to, so they're reluctant to go first. So we have them first hash their bids and then submit the hashes. So that sort of, it sort of binds them to their bids. They cannot change their bids because the hash is one way or it's uh, collision resistant, they're not afraid to go first because it's one way and all that. So you should understand how the hash properties come into play here. There is a problem with this, okay, it doesn't actually work. Fix it, that's a homework problem. It's not that hard to fix. Okay, another, okay, just one more kind of uh, uh, clever use of hash functions. There are many of these, you know, this is just a, another one I just like to throw out here. Uh, suppose we want to reduce spam. I know, um, I don't know about you, but I hate getting all this spam. I get spam every day. If I don't respond to your email, it's not because I don't like you, it's because I got so much spam, I just lost it in the shuffle there. Um, so here's a proposal. Instead of just accepting any email that shows up, before I'm going to accept it, I want some evidence that the sender actually did some work to create this email message. Now, work, I mean work in terms of CPU cycles. They actually had to do some computation to create this email message. So the idea is this would not prevent spam. Okay, somebody who really wants to compute some bogus email messages could do this. They could do the work and you know, send out a few messages, but they can't send out millions of messages or hundreds of thousands of messages because it just takes too much work to do all the computation that's required. And if you want to send regular email, you know, a few emails now and then, it's no problem. You can do the calculation, okay? So it's not going to prevent spam. The goal is just to make it more costly to create and send spam. All right? Uh, okay, so how can we use a hash function to do this? Okay, well, here's a, possible, here's a possibility. So I'm going to take the email message. And this, this is everything. This is like to and from and everything's in the email, okay? So all that stuff's there. I'm going to put the current time in there as well. And then I'm going to choose a value R. So this is a value I'm free to choose as the sender. Okay, I'm going to keep choosing different values of R. And for each different value I choose, I'm going to hash these three guys together until I get an output that starts off with, let's say, n consecutive zeros. Now, how many hashes is it going to take me to get a value that produces n consecutive zeros? Three, four, now give me a number, come on. Be brave. In a hash function you can think of where random inputs essentially produces a random output. Okay, and by changing the value of R, I'm changing the input, so I'm getting a bunch of random different inputs. So basically it's like a random number generator. So how many random numbers do you need to look at before you see one that starts with N zero? about two to the n. Okay, one out of every two to the n should start with n consecutive zeros. Okay, so I need to hash about two to the n of these guys to produce this. Okay, that's, depending on the value of n, that could take a little while, right? If n is 20, that's a million hashes I need to compute before I get one that's correct. If it's 30, that's two, you know, a billion hashes I need to compute. It may take a little while. Okay, now what does the recipient do? Well, before I'm going to accept an email, I'm going to take these values that show up, M, R, and T, I'm going to hash them and make sure what? Right number of zeros. It starts off with these N consecutive zeros. If it doesn't, I'm going to say, hey, this person didn't do the required work, so I'm not even going to look at that email. All right? Okay, so how much work is it for the sender? In terms of hashes? Uh, sender? Oh. 
2 to the n. Okay, you have to compute about 2 to the n hashes until you find the proper value of R that makes work. How much work is it for the recipient? One hash. Okay, no matter what n is, it's only one hash. Okay, so this kind of fits our requirements here. We can choose the value of n so that it's too much work for a spammer to send a lot of email, but still, if you want to send a few emails, computing a million hashes is really not very computationally intensive. But computing several billion hashes might take a while. Okay, so we could choose that so that it's okay for an ordinary user to send email, but it's uh, too much work for, um, for uh, a spam. Yeah? Isn't it true? It looks to me like that only works for custom customized email messages. Otherwise, the sender could just send the same MR and T to 50 million people. Well, okay, so that's the thing. Sender and receiver have to be in there. So you have to make an email for each individual person you want to send this email to. You know, otherwise, you could just create one message and send it out to lots of people. Yeah. So you have to put that little caveat in there. Uh, what about other practical concerns? Are there other issues if you actually wanted to do this in practice? If you had a mailing list that's actually valid? Yeah, there you go. I mean, what if you want to send out to a mailing list and there are like thousands and thousands of users? Well, maybe you could choose N smaller, right, in that particular case and they would be willing to accept it if it's from this mailing list and N is small and so on and so forth. So conceivably, you could work around those kind of things. Um, what else? Any other potential problems? Um, well, a lot of spam is sent through like zombie networking right. okay. and stuff, and they don't care how much compute time they steal from someone else. Well, <laughs> well, how about this? I mean, suppose you actually, I mean, just getting everyone to agree on some system like this and actually implementing it could be pretty challenging, but suppose you actually get yeah, people to, to agree on this and everybody's using this system, uh, what's going to happen then? Spammers are going to have massive, you know, farms of computers out there computing hashes so that they can get these things uh, sent. And they're going to be sending out, you know, uh, attacking your computer, getting uh, botnets on your computer so that they can use your computer to compute hashes. And, uh, it's it's an interesting idea, and it's kind of nice. It doesn't require keys or anything like that. Um, you know, could conceivably help. <laughs>